Jesus' custom was to worship each Sabbath. And for him, which as a Jew, it meant coming to worship on Friday evening. Because for Jews, sundown was the beginning of a new day. So when the sun goes down, that begins the, ne- the new day. And so Jews worship, both the Jewish congregation that works at, worships here at Colonial Church, it starts at sundown on Friday evening. And in his day, like today, Jews would come together for synagogue, synagogue worship service, which aside, if you went to a Jewish service, aside from it being largely in Hebrew, it's really pretty much what we do on Sunday mornings. It's very similar. But things weren't always like that for Jews. Weekly worship only began to happen a few centuries before Jesus. But for the hundreds and hundreds of years before that, going way back, way back before there were priests, before there were churches or temples, synagogues, there were people and there were rocks. Jacob reached a certain place and spent the night there. When the sun had set, he took one of the stones at that place and put it near his head. Then he lay down there. He dreamed and saw a raised staircase, its foundation on earth and its top touching the sky, and God's messengers were ascending and descending on it. Suddenly the Lord was standing on it, saying, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will become like the dust of the earth. You will spread out to the west, east, north, and south. Every family of earth will be blessed because of you and your descendants. I am with you now. I will protect you everywhere you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done everything that I have promised you. When Jacob woke from his sleep, he thought to himself, The Lord is definitely in this place, but I didn't know it. He was terrified and thought, this place, sacred place, is awesome. It's none other than God's house and the entrance to heaven. And Jacob got up early in the morning. He took the stone that he had put near his head, set it up as a sacred pillar, and poured oil on the top of it. He named that sacred place Bethel though Luz was the city's original name. Jacob made a solemn promise. If God is with me and protects me on this trip I'm taking and gives me bread to eat and clothes to wear and I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God. This stone that I've set up as a sacred pillar will be God's house and of everything you give me, I will give a tenth back to you. So any hikers out there, when you go out on a, on a hiking, how many of you have seen these cairns that are built places? Very, yeah, they're everywhere. You find these pillars of rocks by waterfalls, rivers. I went, I went on a hike this summer, and there was one, it was down by a waterfall, and there must have been 50, 60 of these cairns that were built all over the place. They're not only trendy, but they are a spiritual reaction to feeling God's presence in a certain place. It's a way of honoring the experience of the sacred, and it's an ancient practice. So in the years that after Jacob set up his cairn and started the practice of making a tithe, of giving one-tenth of of what he had, after... And you notice he had the big conditional after he did safely return to his father's household when his older brother, who he had, take, um, had robbed out of an inheritance, didn't kill him. After he was indeed safe, Jacob returns to Bethel, and he does. He built a larger altar to God. And then much later, hundreds of years later, after Moses, this Site, this place became an important holy site for the 12 tribes of Israel. Priests took up residence. And it's just a few miles north. You can see it's hard to see back there from the map, but it's just 
kind of right in the center there that you have that middle, middle row, about one third of the way up, that's Bethel. And it's right a couple of miles outside of where Jerusalem would be. And so it's just north of where the temple would eventually be built. And so at various holidays, people from all over the land would trek to holy sites like Bethel. So on holidays, they would get together and honor and celebrate God. Because there wasn't really weekly worship. That wasn't something that they did. But you had this periodic holiday worship. And so holiday tra traditions developed. And these holidays became get-togethers, which were so important because it was from these get-togethers that the nation of Israel would kind of re-identify re themselves as Israel. It kept them together. And then later, you got the temple. The temple was built in Jerusalem, and it became the center of worship. Now, at this time, then, priests were engaged in daily worship there in the temple. And it became the primary spot for the nation to gather on holidays, but, you know, all the time. People would make pilgrimages to the temple. But some people who lived days and days away from the temple, they couldn't make it all the way to Jerusalem. So often they would meet at holy, they'd still go to those old holy sites. And after the temple was destroyed for the first, during the first time, and the Jews went into exile, they were taken as prisoners into Babylon. Things were different when they came back. They no longer had the temple. They no longer had access to the holy sites. So after they returned to Jerusalem, they began a new kind of worship. When the seventh month came and the people of Israel were settled in their towns, all the people gathered together in the area in front of the water gate. They asked Ezra, the scribe, to bring out the instruction scroll from Moses, according to which the Lord had instructed Israel. He read it in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand, and everyone listened attentively to the instruction scroll. Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that had been made for this pu purpose. Standing above all of the people, Ezra the scribe opened the scroll in the sight of all of the people. And as he opened it, all of the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all of the people answered, Amen, amen, while raising their hands when they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. That was the first time that we have recorded of a worship service that would seem familiar to you, similar to what we do today. Because our ancestors learned while they were in exile, they learned that for a community of faith to survive, it needed to become portable. Scriptures and rabbis, scriptures and teachings, the Jewish Bibles and the teachers who taught the ancient, and they were, those scriptures were already ancient in the ancient world. They had been around for um, um, 2,000 years. The ancient stories of faith. And just as oppressed people have found over the millennia, be they African slaves, European serfs, the poor in Asia. Coming together around scripture and teachers was the secret to survival as a community. The faith and the hope that was given in those weekly worships. Think about the energy in a gospel worship service. The idea was is that it was the faith and the hope of that message that gave so many the strength to persevere through things that we would shudder at. And sometimes it even they would hear the message of the slaves who threw off the yoke of oppression. All of that came from this secret that they learned in exile. It's potent. 
weekly worship services became, became a way of faith communities coming together to reconnect as a community, to recharge and strengthen, to persevere. And years passed. Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire. Huge temples got built. Churches and there were cathedrals everywhere. And the clergy became less teachers and more public officials. And there were those who were called out, who called out for change, who didn't like this change. Now, in just a few weeks, we're going to celebrate Thanksgiving here. Our Board of Parish Life was already back there planning our wonderful Thanksgiving dinner in a few weeks. Our pilgrim and Puritan ancestors came to America to trying to get back to their, their community worship, back to basics. And they were, they were trying to purify themselves of what they felt the Church of England had going on, less, smell, less smells and bells and more scripture and teaching. And they were really hardcore about it. Meeting houses, places where our Congregationalist ancestors would meet, there was no music. There was no sitting. Clergy began to wear academic robes to show that they were studied and trained. Mine is actually a hybrid robe. It's part academic, part clerical. There you go. They would be so disappointed seeing all this singing and sitting that we do in this church. They were not a very tolerant lot. And that brings me to today. Right now, in the few years that we just happen to be alive, we are seeing one of those great shifts in how people worship. Church buildings in this neighborhood, in this com wider community, this nation, this world, there are so many fewer. You look around Prairie Village. I was thinking about this too. When I started at this, with this congregation, in the Kansas side of the metro area, there were five UCC churches. At the beginning of this coming year, we are the last one. That's something. Church buildings in neighborhoods and everywhere stand empty today. And then there are others, like us, who are trying to find their way in new realities. Some are abandoning the communal aspect of worship and focusing on spiritual experiences because they need to feel something. So they go to places, they go on and build cairns when they experience something of God in nature. You see this all over now. That is a spiritual act of worship. Now, some move to honoring God primarily on holidays. Some are trying to hold on to the age of cathedrals by building impressive temples in our time. And there are some that are trying to simplify just to the point of having house meetings where you get 12, 8 to 12 people gathering in people's homes to learn and to be a community together. Some are just changing styles in worship. There is so much change going on right now. God's people have always been in these kinds of changes. From the early days of Jacob to now, there is a human need to experiencing, to experience something holy and to honor that. Maybe it's the birth of a child. Maybe it's those intense moments in nature. But that human need to experience the holy, it will not change. Church communities will adapt their worship to new times because we seek to experience God in one another, incarnationally in the church family that we create. 
to grow and deepen our journey with the God of Jesus. Now, sometimes I do this thing, I'll meditate with people online. You all just meet up at the top of the hour, and there's a group of sometimes dozens or hundreds of people that will just be meditating together. And as I'm doing this online, I wonder sometimes, will worship become an online experience? Sometimes I wonder, what will bring people together in community? Is it shared belief? Is it our shared work together? Is it shared wisdom that you come that's greater than any one of us? Or maybe it's all of the above. We get to figure out what that is. God's spirit is in each of us, guiding us as she's always done. So much is changing, and I have no idea what worship is going to look like in 100 years. i way above my pay grade. I have no idea. What I have, what we have, is right now. And over the next few weeks, we're going to be spending some time in our Sunday mornings working on our vision, our 2020 vision, we're calling it. I love that. Our church leadership has been working on this for a while. And we're trying to figure out where this, not like the whole, like all of Christianity around the world, but where this church community is at this moment. What's God's spirit doing here with us? Whether you walked in here for the first time today or you've been coming here your entire life. Because what I know is this, because I see this all the time in you. I know that God's spirit exists in you in each of us, and in all of us. When we come together, we reconnect. We recharge. We sometimes experience holiness and beauty in in the world. It's right there. And however that looks, we will find the strength and the hope to persevere and transform this world with the power of compassion because this is who and what we are together. Will you pray with me? Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless God's holy name. Honor and respect God. Experience the holiness of the gift of creation. Celebrate that we are together. And as long as the God's Holy Spirit gives us life, we will work nonviolently for justice and mercy, inclusivity and compassion. This is the way of Jesus, the way in which we are baptized and blessed to live. Amen.